Hey folks, welcome to the Market Huddle Plus episode where we get a previous guest back on the show for a quick 30-minute update. I'm Kevin Muir, and this week I have the good fortune to talk to fan favorite Harris Kupperman. Cuppy, thanks for coming back, bud. Hey, thanks for inviting me back. So this is going to be a lot of fun, and I want to do something a little different because we're going to talk uranium, but we're not going to talk about the actual fundamental story because by now everybody knows the story. Everyone knows that it's been the hottest trade around. I want to talk about the period before that when it wasn't so for sure going up and it wasn't hot and you were kind of alone in the wilderness just being long. <laughs> and I, I remember just yelling at the sky. <laughs> you were yelling at the sky. And I and I distinctly remember talking to you about it. And I remember, you know, you just buying it every single day. It didn't matter. You were just, you know, kept buying U.UN or SPUD, as you guys call it in the States. And you had very little kind of doubt and it was just like, I know this is going to work. I know this is a great trade. I'm going to continue on. And I want to just kind of understand how you had that level of confidence and maybe talk about how you managed it as it did nothing. <laughs> well, because well, it mean, did do nothing. For a long time, it went sideways, right? It was like you felt like you were just uh, talking to nobody. Right. I mean, it, it didn't trade much volume. Uh, I traded sideways. Every once in a while, some hedge fund would just puke it up, usually around quarter end. And I, I, I was the only guy buying. Sometimes I'd be like 20% of the volume that day. And, you know, every time it, it was down a buck, I just stood in there and bought a couple hundred thousand more. <laughs> but I, I, I never had any doubt, you know. And I mean, this isn't really a victory lap. I'm not here to Gucci it. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's early innings of this trade still. But um right. You know, it's suddenly it, it, it's visible and people are chasing. And I mean, I feel kind of stupid. Uh, I see people out there buying 22, 23, 24 handle when I was buying at 16 handle. And, you know, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to research. You know, I have a process. Uh, I'm very, very thorough. And, you know, when the data lines up, I don't really second guess it. And I feel like so much of the market, they're kind of lazy or maybe not lazy is the right word, but. For them, research means watching a couple of YouTube videos and, you know, checking out what Twitter says this, you know, this week about uranium. That's not research. That's just, you know, it's just kind of checking with the mob things. You know, research is actually doing research. And once you've done real work, you have conviction in a trade. And then you could just sit there and, and, and wait. You know, it, it's, it's got a very, you know, light theta component. It's 35 bips a year that I'm paying to Sprout to manage it. So it's not like it's burning down, um, you know, and... And the fundamentals said the market kept getting tighter and you'd talk to market participants. And they'd say, dude, it's tighter. It's tighter. Trades are failing. Uh, you know, we're, we're owed deliveries that aren't showing up. We lent uh, product out and we can't get it back. Like, you know, you, you start hearing like fear and panic in the voices of the people in the industry. And then, you know, you kind of look at the screen and the, you know, Spud is sitting there at 16. And I felt like Michael Burry in many ways, you know, remember that scene in the movie where everyone's defaulting on their mortgages and, you know, like he's looking at the CDO cube and he's saying, why is this thing bid 101? Like, like it, it's, it's all blowing up. And, you know, he'd call every couple hours, get, get a quote and it was still bid 101. It's costing him like a million bucks a week to carry it. And he's just banging his drums against the wall and banging his head <laughs> on the wall. Like that's kind of how I felt for the last six months. Cause it was so obvious that the, the thing was breaking. Um, and I even put a blog post out, uh, out about this. And I said, everyone's a chart guy. And when the chart looks right, which means it breaks out to a new all-time high of Sput, which is over 20, they're all going to chase. And it's exactly That's, what happened. It right. went from 20 to 25 in effectively two weeks. And now it's pulling back a bit. But it, it, it's just kind of funny. So much of the world is focused on charts, which means you pay up and then you know you, you take all the risk when the world really should be focused on the fundamentals. And I think one other thing, and I'll stop rambling about this, is so many of my friends in this industry who run hedge funds, they're so worried about, hey, Cuppy, it trades at a discount to NAV. What if the discount expands? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if it goes 500 bips against me? I have to report it to my LPs. Then my LPs will be mad. And maybe I get redemptions. And I definitely don't grow my fund. And you know, They have all these other ulterior battles going on in their head right. when they only should be thinking, you know, how do I foolproof this trade so I just can't get screwed? And if it goes mark to market at 1,000 bips against me, I just add more. And I just think people have the wrong mental construct in this industry because they're so focused about their own personal little struggles of building a, a business, especially because most of my friends who have business, you know, hedge fund businesses, they're kind of undercapitalized, bootstrapping it. You know, they're, they're all out trying to have a good quarter so they can market it. Like all these battles go against you and you end up 
making dumb decisions. And I have a lot of friends who every time it started perking up, they buy it at 18, they'd sell it at 16 over and over again. Right. That's not the way to make money. <laughs> but, but, you know, it'd go against them and they just stop out. They, they couldn't take the pain of, you know, it went from 18 to 16. What if it goes to 15? Right. And let's talk, well, first of all, I think the fact that you did the research yourself and you mentioned that, you said you knew the story, you knew that it was a, a fundamentally a positive story, gave you that kind of confidence and when it's someone else's story, when it's someone who said, oh, you know, you should buy this, and then all of a sudden it marks against you a buck or two, it's a lot scarier, and it's like you're not as sure. Do you think that that kind of research was the main reason that you were kind of so confident? Or or do you really feel like this is a unique situation where I guess it just it lined up so perfectly? Like, And, and, and I guess what I'm asking is, do you always feel this way on every piece of research you do, or is it? This one was especially good. No, nah, we do some shitty research. We get them wrong all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so know? how do you, I but, guess what I'm asking is how did you know that this wasn't a, 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 like that you hadn't got it wrong and that you stuck with it? Cause you did. And I have to give you all the credit in the world. You were like, nope, 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 nope. It's head, it's headed higher. And well, how I texted you, you every day. I'm like, Kevin, I, know, I don't I get it, it, but you need to have some more. <laughs> <laughs> And so what what gave you that level of confidence in this story? So the margin of safety was so wild, you know, and I don't want to get into the fundamentals, but you had uh, very rough numbers, 160 million pounds of production and 210 of demand. And that 50 million deficit expands next year. And so you could be off on a ton of your, your numbers. You know, you could be missing a mine in China. You could be missing a mine in Uzbekistan. You know, maybe, you know, Niger does something. You know, you have all these bits and pieces on the supply side. And you have all these bits and pieces on the demand side. You know, maybe some of our math is wrong there with enrichment. And, you know, you, you, you have so much buffer that you say this thing is just a massive deficit. And that deficit is just going to eat through uh, inventory. And, you know, the question to, to us always was, why is there no price response? And we can get into that later if you want. But, you know, it was just that this deficit was so big that eventually that that warehouse in the sky was going to be emptied. <laughs> it's empty now. You know, right. he, he, that, that was what gave me the confidence in this. OK. And then in terms of, you know, another kind of thought, it might be, why did you sit with it for six months? Uh, why wouldn't you just wait for the market to start caring? Well, I mean, when the market starts caring, you have to pay up. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to pay 20, you know, a month or two later. I mean, my cost of capital is very high, but I'm not going to pay up 25%. I mean, my cost of capital isn't that high. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, look, I, I run a fund. Uh, I don't want to use numbers here. I'm, I'm not soliciting. But, you know, we have a couple million shares of this spot. And, you know, if we wanted to buy a couple million shares today when it's on the move, like I'd run it a couple dollars. Uh, right. And I might not even get filled. Like, you got to buy it on the bid. You got to be patient. You got to build a position. You know, there's, there's some you know foreshadowing needed. You need to, you know, right now I'm starting to think of what I want to be buying Q4 for, you know, the trades we're going to put on for second half 24. You know, you got to buy it, hold an inventory and, you know, build up your position and be ready for the next set of trades that are going to work. Like you have to play it forward a bit. Like you can't just be chasing the offer as it starts running. I mean, that's what retail does. Yeah, and I guess that's the main point is that you're trading a different size and people need to remember that is that you need to buy it because you have to accumulate it for a while and it's not something you can get overnight. It's not like the liquidity is there for you. But having well, said I that, did. sorry, I, I guess my uh, one of the things I wanted to remark on though is uh, everyone's always like coming up with these great theories and they think they can time it. And I always say to them, look, the risk reward is skewed this way. I suspect the surprise will be this way. But if you ask me to time when it happens, I can't do it. Like I've been bearish on bonds for a while. Did I know that it was going to be the dots that were going to cause the final or, or at least the, the most recent route? No, I had no clue. But I knew that the risk reward was skewed that way. And I was wondering, do you feel the same way that like actually trying to time it is, is almost a mugs game? I think it is. I mean, we had a couple false starts in uranium and then it just kind of fell back to earth. And I was like, this is the time it's really going. And it fell back. I just bought some more on the pullback. I, I think timing this stuff is really difficult. Um, I think it's kind of stupid also. Like you want to be buying the bottom of the range. And every time it tests the bottom of the range, you just add more. Like, 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 like I said, I mean, so many people are so focused on how do I maximize my IRR by only owning things in motion or how do I, you know, 
reduce my risk by buying the breakout and then stopping out if it comes back into the range. Like those are all terrible strategies. I mean, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but that's just not the right way to do it. I mean, Buffett just buys a bunch of stuff and he just sits there. Right. And, you know, look, he was two years early. I mean, I think it's one of the greatest trades ever. He he, he bought those uh, four or five uh, Japanese uh, uh, multinational houses, conglomerates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he bought those things and everyone's just like, ah, the old man's lost his marbles, you know? <laughs> he sat there for two years, just accumulating, accumulating. He ended up owning, what, he's the largest shareholder of each of these things. Yes. And then they just started ripping. And on the way up, he couldn't buy them. But look, I mean, guys, you know, running billion dollar funds complain that, you know, the, the, the market's a liquid. They can't do the things that they want to do. I mean, Buffett's doing this with like, what, a half trillion dollars? And he put multi billion dollar positions to work and he has multi baggers in these things. It, it's impressive that, you know, a guy who's almost 100 is running laps around the rest of the hedge fund industry. And, and the reason he's able to do that is he can be patient. He doesn't care if it goes against him one month. He has to report a down month to his LPs. He, he just can buy good things cheap and, you know, buy it when no one really wants it, store it in inventory for a year and then run with it. It's, it's the better way to invest, I think. I, monthly I, returns and monthly reporting, I think, has really messed up people's minds. I, I was digging through my trading wisdom the other day and I came across something Louis Rukeyser asked um, Philip Caret, and I believe he was the founder of the Pioneer Fund. He says, what's the single most important thing you've learned about investing over the past three quarters of a century? And Philip had one word for him, patience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and can we talk a little bit about when you went to the conference? I, I'm, I'm interested in terms of how that played out with the uranium, because in, in hindsight, that was definitely the moment where kind of the fundamentals became laid out for everyone and it started to run. And, I, and I'd love to just get your experience of that uranium conference and, and what it what it happened and how that kind of ties to the price of uranium and the uranium stocks. So let me preface this by saying that I'm an inflection investor. I do the same thing. I've been doing the same thing for 25 years, which is that I show up in boring sleeping industries where no one has any expectations because it's probably never happened in their career. And I say, you know, a hundred sigma event can happen. and Everyone laughs at me because they've never seen it happen in their careers. Yet I've seen it happen dozens of times in my career because I float in and out of these industries usually at an inflection point where something's you know, misaligned and there's, there's about to be a lot of beta. Um, and uh, so I show up in this industry and these guys are nuclear physicists, I guess. You know, they're, they're way smarter than me. I mean, I, I can barely spell the word nuclear. And um, you know, I'm, I'm telling them the price of uh, uranium is going higher and they're telling me it can't go any higher because you know, at the time the price is 59. And they're, they're saying this is historically a high price. It, it's at the top of the range. Maybe it goes five, ten dollars higher, but it can't really go much higher. And I'm going, okay. And then meanwhile, they're telling me that uh, the purchase orders aren't showing up. And the guy who they bought it from is saying next month, next month. But they're starting to question if next month ever happens. And they're running down their inventory. And they're starting to get antsy. And they're, they're, they're called their fuel buyer. But their fuel buyer says there's no pounds to be bought at any price. And you know, I, I had one fuel buyer at the conference tell me that he's short a couple hundred thousand pounds. And he doesn't want to cover. And he's, the reason he didn't want to cover is he thought he'd move it $10. And if you move to ten dollars, he'd lose a few million personally. But he goes, I, I, "I've made some money in this industry, but I'm going to bankrupt a bunch of the guys in the room. They're all going to be mad at me next year." And I said, "If you bankrupt them, they're not going to be here next year." And he he, he just couldn't uh, recognize that. But I mean, if you blow up your hedge fund, you, you you don't go to the hedge fund you know party at the end of the year. And then these these guys just couldn't recognize the fact that you know they, they could blow up and you know their buddies wouldn't be there anymore. And the fact that he thought, you know, a couple hundred thousand pounds would run at 10, yet he said the price probably won't go up much, yet he couldn't find any pounds. Like, you just talk to these people. And I think the real issue in uranium is that there's no transmission mechanism. So, like, if you look at the oil market, there's a thousand guys covering the oil market. And if we thought the oil market was going to have a 25 million barrel a day deficit, 25%, just like with uranium, you, you'd have a bunch of wise guy hedge funds that would go buy oil futures. They'd go buy uh, storage and store oil. They'd put all sorts of trades on. The price of oil would go up. It would incentivize guys to produce more oil. And then the deficit wouldn't show up or the deficit would be a lot less than expected because you know it takes a couple of years for these things to build. In the uranium market, no one follows it except two hedge fund friends of mine. Uh, who've been dead right about everything. There's no one else following it. There's not a single Wall Street analyst following it. The Wall Street analysts just take the industry association numbers. The industry association every year sets its balance. <laughs> Even though it was in surplus a bunch of years, the deficit a bunch of years, it's always balanced for the industry association. 
uh, and they just take those numbers and, and, re and report them as, as gospel. And then there's no transmission mechanism. Like if I want to go buy uranium, I can't just store it in my living room. Right. Like I, I can't go store it anywhere. You know, there's a hundred acronyms that have to background check me. And so as a result, there's, there's no price mechanism that pushes the price up. There's no transmission where people say there's a deficit to suddenly the price goes up to suddenly mines are incentivized to start producing, which is why it's going to horribly overshoot. And, you know, I was at this conference and there's no other finance guys there. And everyone's just like, so what are you guys doing here? Why are you here? Like no <laughs> one really understood what we were doing. Yet they're all telling me like I lent pounds to this guy and he says he can't give them back to me because the guy he was meant to buy them from just went bankrupt. And that guy owes some other guy pounds. And it's like the whole ecosystem is breaking. It's, it's like the CDO crisis, you know, everything's breaking. All the plumbing is breaking. And yet no one seems to care. And it hasn't reflected in the price because. You know, the, the price is an artificial construct. Uh, in, in the end, about 10% of uh, uranium is transacted at the spot market, everything else in the term market. And there's a lot of incentive for utilities to hold the spot market down because they, they, they buy it with uh, contracts that reference the spot market. So there's a lot of incentive for them to manipulate the spot price down so that they can then get their offtakes from producers cheaper. So you have utilities basically buying term, selling the spot market, holding it down. This whole weird reflexive thing that just has kept price capped forever. And the whole thing was starting to break. And you could see it at the conference because everyone was kind of sweating. Did, so was that kind of like your Steve Carell with the, with the exotic dancer owning seven houses moment? Yeah, yeah, basically. But it was like a, maybe five minutes later in the movie. <laughs> but but like i'd be talking to these guys and while i'm talking to these guys i'm like i gotta sh do an email and i'm really just logging into my ib account and just buying more buying more buying more on my cell phone i'm just ripping it as fast as i can like market order just just get it done because there's got to be some other finance guy at this conference and it's me versus him to, to see who can put the orders in faster right so that was kind of I, so i thought that was the the start of where it went because from then it just became a food fight um now, obviously, I, I, you're not selling. You're still long term bullish, as you said. Like, obviously, you traded around, but you're not. You're not changing your thesis. Um, moving on to another thesis, if we could, and we'll talk ab about kind of owning something and the volatility and the pain that's involved with owning something. Let's talk about Argentina, <laughs> because you've talked about this before, and here's an example of something you feel somewhat strongly about, but I guess it went up and it's back down. Yeah, I, I, a proper round trip this one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so why, do you, why do you actually give people the fundamental story of argentina and what you're doing and uh and then we'll go we'll talk about the psycho psychological uh, you know aspect of that so about once a decade uh argentina has an economic crisis and it seems to last about 10 years and um <laughs> I think I've done that joke before. <laughs> I, you know what? I haven't heard that again. You know, it took me a little while and I almost spit my water up while I was doing it. <laughs> but, I mean, look, it used to be the richest country in the world a uh, hundred years ago. And now it's just this dysfunctional place. And um, it's gotten to the point where it's kind of hit rock bottom. And they've tried socialism for a hundred years. And they finally decided socialism doesn't work. And you have this guy named uh, Malay who is sort of a nut job. I mean, he is a nut job. Uh, but enough people agree that it takes a nut job to fix things that they're willing to vote for him. And he's an anacro libertarian. Uh, his, his only campaign promise is to fire everyone in the government, uh, then blow up the central bank with dynamite. Uh, and then I, it's not really clear what his plan is afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got uh, he's probably going to win the the election. There's a pretty good chance he's going to win. Um, and I, I think some of his steps make a lot of sense. I mean, Argentina is fixable. It's uh, it's well educated country, full of natural resources. The world needs natural resources. It's actually a surprising amount of infrastructure. Uh, but you know, you, you can't run a country when your currency declines ten percent a week, and you have no access to dollars, and you have all these exchange controls. I mean, it's an agricultural uh, economy. You know, a big piece of the economy is soybeans, and you can't buy seeds or fertilizer because you need dollars, and then you can't sell it because there's uh, export uh, restrictions. So you can't sell your soybeans overseas. So what's the point of farming? And all the farms are sitting fallow. Like a lot of these things are really easy to fix. Okay. It, only socialists could screw it up this badly. And I think he'll actually succeed in fixing it. What really makes it interesting, though, is that uh, Vaca Muerta looks like it's the second best uh, shale deposit in the world. 
uh, second only to the Permian. And that's with them using like 1980s technology to drill the stuff. Uh, their, their, their sand loadings in the frack are, you know, laughable. So it might actually be better than uh, Permian. Just no one really knows. And uh, I think if they, f- if, if uh, Malay wins, I think you're going to see all the oil majors go in and start producing in, in Vaca Muerte. I think they're going to export a lot of oil, which will give them a lot of dollars, which will fix a lot of the other problems in the country. And look, I think Argentina is going to have a couple year run where it's probably incrementally better. And then it's Argentina. They're probably going to screw it up again. But, you know, I'm not going to stick around long enough to figure out if they screw it up or, or not. I'm, I'm just there to see if Malay wins. And then if he does what he plans to do, I think it's going to be super chaotic because, I mean, it's hard to run a, a business when, you, when you know, they, 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 they cancel the currency. And it's do probably you, gonna do be you really think he's really going to do that? Like, do you think that's just yeah. talk? Oh, you do? No, I think he really plans to cancel the currency. And yes. do you think that, like, when he originally was getting more popular, that people welcomed it and that's why the stocks rallied? And then as they kind of viewed the erratic nature of his of his chatting and, and his policies that they sold it back off. Like, do you think he's no, actually part of the problem? No, no, I don't think it's that. I think what, what happened is that um, they the, 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 the socialists in charge, they, they've created a lot of problems for themselves uh, in the last couple of uh, the last month or so. They, they capped the price of oil. So, you know, oil, which is a reasonably large industry there, uh, they, they capped the price below the cost of producing it. So everyone just stopped producing oil, which meant the currency collapsed. They stopped defending the currency. So it collapsed more. The bonds collapsed. Like a lot of the stocks, remember, you know, they, they, they trade in Argentina. So when the currency collapses, you know, the, 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 the stocks priced in U.S. dollars collapsed too. Uh, and that, that's just been what's happening in Argentina. I mean, U.S. hedge funds, there's not a lot of U.S. hedge funds, you know, messing around in Argentina. There's a handful of us. Uh, we're not big enough to offset all of the currency depreciation of local guys. And so, you know, as the currency drops a couple percent every week, uh, the stocks are dropping with right. it. Um, uh, so is YPF the, the way to play this? I don't think there's any one way to play it. If I say YPF is the way to play it, that's the only one that doesn't work. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm long YPF, though. Uh, you know, I, I own a bunch of it. No, I, there's a, about a half dozen uh, GDRs, and I, I own all of them. What what is a GDR? Uh, I, I don't even never heard of that. It's like it, an ADR, it's like an ADR but, but it's it's different. I, I I can't explain to you the why. It's just called a GDR, and that's the, the way it is. Uh, okay, but so, but I, I I own a bunch of these things. Uh, you know, it's hard to do fundamental analysis on a comp- on a country that has a couple hundred percent uh, inflation, and you know, it, it's all kind of a made up economy right now. And I think after Malay wins, there's going to be a couple weeks of true chaos, and. Uh, I, I tend to think uh, the solutions will work and they'll work really fast. Um, but for right now, you know, you have guys like The Economist that hate Malay because he's a libertarian. And, you know, they're, they're saying how bad he's going to be. And it's kind of like when Trump won. Everyone said how bad it would be. And then the stock market was down for like a couple hours. <laughs> and then right. it went straight up. I think the same thing's going to happen here. And, but, you know, going back to, you know, strength of convictions, uh, we're, we're watching one thing only, just like with uranium. We were watching the fact that inventory or the deficit is running at a million pounds a month. And eventually that, you know, warehouse in the sky runs out. In the case of Argentina, we're just watching the polling numbers. And Argentine polling numbers are highly erratic and somewhat questionable, I think. But, you know, directionally, they say that Malay is gaining in the polls. And uh, that, 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 that means he's likely to going to win. And then he's likely going to do the thing he said he's going to do. Uh, unlike a lot of politicians who talk a lot and do nothing, I have a feeling Malay will do everything he intends, which includes probably setting the dynamite himself at uh, the central bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Gabby, I can always count on you and being colorful. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Let's talk. Let's talk a little macro. You think, sure. Uh, so I saw the Santelli rant for about bonds could go to 13%. Uh, I'm hearing uh, one of the guys I like following Ed Bradford, I think is his name. If I got his name right, he said he got his, the, the call from his mother about interest rates. Um, you know, weren't worrying about it. It, is it feel panicky enough in the bond market for this to be the bottom? No, I mean, it's not even, it's still inverted. I mean, <laughs> tens are still inverted. W- w- wake me up when, uh, w- 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 the inversion's done. Like it, it's not panicky at all. Uh, All right. So, although look, I did, I, think, I did see the other day that the TLT, um, our our buddy Jack Farley uh, t- tweeted this out. He said something about the fact that the the long bond future is now down more as a percentage than if you own stocks in the Great Financial Crisis. 
<laughs> Great. I mean, <laughs> I can't believe the long bond got where it got to. It's, it's, true. it's insane. Uh, it's true. The one percent, like where or wherever it started, it was the real problem, not where it is now. Look, over the last fifty years, a six percent rate is kind of you know somewhere in the median. You know, not mean, but median area. Why can't it get back to six? I mean, that, that that's just kind of like mean reversion gets back to historical, and then usually these things overshoot. I mean. I wouldn't be surprised if it got into the teens. I mean, it's not going to get there, you know, this week. But uh, I think over time, it's probably going to go there unless uh, our government uh, has some, you know, fiscal sanity. Uh, I assume it's going to keep going higher. I mean, think how ridiculous it is that we're running a effectively 8% nominal GDP, effectively 8% deficits uh, in the boom. So it's probably like <laughs> teens in, in, in the next yeah. recession. That's right, because we're three and a half percent unemployment and they're running an 8% deficit. Look, uh, payroll, uh, what's it called? Uh, payroll tax was up 9% uh, year over year for Q3. Like the, the economy is really strong. So how is the 10 at four and change? It makes no sense. It should have a six handle. It just makes no sense. The problem is that a six handle, uh, all the Wall Street guys are going to be insolvent because everyone in Wall Street plays with lots of leverage. And so you have all these Wall Street guys crying and crying and crying. But my friends in the real economy, I mean, it hasn't been better for them. Uh, it really is a one percenter depression. That, 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 that's all what it is. And unfortunately, you know, those Wall Street guys are the ones writing the articles. But, um, <laughs> do you think that do you think that the higher rates uh, are going to cause significant problems in the stock market? I mean, at some point, it, it has to, right? I mean, these businesses uh, have to fund themselves. And a lot of them right now, <laughs> you know, they, they, they did five-year bonds uh, in 2021 and 22. And, you know, they got three, four years left on it. And they're putting it back to work at money markets. And they're actually earning a positive carry. Right. But, that, you know, that's not, that's not sustainable long term. Uh, no, I think you're going to see a lot of things. Look, the banks are in free fall. I mean, watch the banks. They always know best. Watch Goldman Sachs, which I'm sure it. Uh, it's in free fall. Like Goldman always knows what's up. Um, no, I think uh, it's going to create a real mess. But, you know, you have lots of sectors of the economy that are going to do just fine. And you have lots of sectors that are going to be terrible. And I think you're going to not really see a stock market crash as much as a giant sector rotation. So you're and, bearish, bearish financial economy, bullish the real economy. Yeah. I mean, that's been the trade I've had on really since uh, 2020. I think that's still the right trade. Got it. Listen, Harris, it's great having you on the show. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, your great blog, your great Twitter account, and your KEDM product? Sure. If you want to find me at uh, Twitter, go to at hcuppy.com. Just uh, bring a filter. Uh, I don't want to offend <laughs> you. <laughs> um, and my blog is at uh, precap.com. Uh, you'll find it there. Uh, and sign up. We won't spam you. We're not selling anything. Uh, well, we're selling Cadm. If you want to, you know, subscribe to Cadm. It's our uh, event-driven service. But uh, r really, you know, just just come join the fun. It's great. Listen, Cuppy, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to the next time. Absolutely, looking forward. Thank you for tuning into this MH Plus episode. And don't forget that our regular full length show airs every second weekend. We're especially excited about this upcoming October 7th show. So make sure you don't miss it. In the meantime, you can check out my partner, Patrick Serezna's website at bigpicturetrading.com. And if you want to see what I'm up to, go to the macrotourist.com. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a few words of wisdom from trading coach Steve Goldstein. Many people who enter trading for money end up subconsciously using it as a way to try and to prove their own genius. They end up neither making money nor proving their genius. Until next time, I'm Kevin Muir, and thanks for listening.